Oh yeah. Be prepared for a jet taking off. <laughs> yeah. Testing one two. Testing one two. Yeah, that's good. Great. Yeah. Hey, can you hear me over there? I'm sorry. Uh, earth deceitin', earth deceitin'. <laughs>
Okay. I'll call this meeting of the House Finance Committee to order. The time is currently 1.33 p.m. on Friday, February 3rd, 2018. Present today, we have Representative Kawasaki, Representative Wilson, Vice Chair, <laughs> Representative Guerra, Co-Chair, Representative Seaton, Representative Tilton, Representative Grin, <laughs> Representative Guttenberg, Representative Thompson, and myself, Co-Chair Foster. And Representatives Ortiz and Pruitt have been previously excused from today's meeting. Before we start, just a reminder, people could uh, mute their cell phones. And um, at this meeting, we will have our third hearing on SB6, which is industrial hemp production. We previously had two hearings on this bill. Uh, the committee had a brief introduction of SB6 on May 1, 2017, and a longer hearing on May 12, 2017. And uh, on that date, on the second meeting, we had public testimony, and we passed out amendment number one. So it's my intent to reopen public testimony today, um, as well as the amendments. And uh, so at this time, I'd like to uh, bring up Senator uh, Shelley Hughes, uh, the sponsor of SB6, as well as Representative Harriet Drummond, the sponsor of HB 172, uh, the House Companion Bill, and uh, also their aides, if they could also come up, uh, Mr. Buddy Witt and Mr. Patrick Fitzgerald, and uh, Senator Hughes, Representative Drummond. Uh, let's see here, if you could go ahead and put yourselves on the record, and maybe folks, we have so many people at the table, if we could just identify ourselves for the record um, prior to speaking. And so with that, um, I guess Representative Drummond, did you have an opening statement? I do. Thank you very much, Co-Chair Foster. Good afternoon. Co-Chair Foster, Co-Chair Seaton, and members of the House Finance Committee. I am Representative Harriet Drummond from House District 18, Spinard and Midtown Anchorage, and my staffer Patrick Fitzgerald is here with me. House Bill 172 allows for a pilot program for cultivation of industrial hemp in the state of Alaska. Section 7606 of the Federal Agricultural Act of 2014 allows for a pilot program to operate in the states to monitor the cultivation, harvesting, and marketing of industrial hemp. Hemp is a very diverse product that has the potential to be successful in mul excuse me, multiple markets, including agriculture, textiles, automotive, and livestock feed, to name just a few. Senate Bill 6 by Senator Hughes is only slightly different from my bill, but I'm here to assure all members of the committee that it meets the intent of House Bill 172. Hemp cultivation will benefit Alaskans no matter what political party they align with, and that's why I fully support the movement of Senate Bill 6 and will help in any way I can to make sure Alaska's hopeful hemp harvesters can get to the fields as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Drummond. Uh, Senator Hughes, did you have anything to add to the uh, record? I do, and thank you so much, uh, Co-Chair Foster. It's a delight to be here. I'm Shelley Hughes, Senator for District uh, F, Palmer Chugiak. And we, you, you did hear the, the bill back in May, but just very briefly, um, the, originally I, the idea for this was brought to me by some farmers and ranchers in my area. They were very interested in, at the time, um, Senator Johnny Ellis's bill. And so we worked a little bit to, to try to see if we could scoot that along. It was late in the session. And so, um, again, it was brought up at town halls and such. And so we reintroduced it two years ago. Delighted to be sitting up here with um, Representative Drummond and have the support um, of, of the bill. And very, just in, in, very brief, it basically is taking hemp and removing it from the marijuana statutes and defining hemp as having less than 0.3% THC, which means it has no psychoactive uh, qualities at all. And um, Representative Drummond mentioned many of the applications, but I'll just, just remind you what I told you last year is interestingly, uh, hemp was actually, a, a paper made from hemp was um, some of the early drafts of the declaration were written on it. It was actually used to uh, make the sales where folks came, came to this continent that were not yet here. And um, uh, some of our founding fathers had fields of hemp. And then it was used as the, for covered wagons as we moved across west and, and eventually folks to Alaska from from the West. So in 1937, the Marijuana Act, um, that was right when cotton was on the rise. 
And instead of paper, uh, paper being produced from hemp, there was a big push to produce paper from wood. And so it kind of took the back seat and fell in with being illegal. So we're just going back and fixing it. Representative Drummond mentioned the Farm Act in 2014 paved the way. And I believe, and, and Buddy has all the details, my, my staffer, Buddy Witt, but the, um, the um, I just lost my train of, train of thought. But, um, oh, the 20, I believe it's 29 states at this point who are on board. So we could be the 30th. And I appreciate your support. I also want to really thank the Division of Ag. They've been very helpful. Uh, Arthur Keyes, the director, and then the, our agronomist, our state agronomist, Rob Carter. And then also Courtney Moran is an attorney that's been helping states around, uh, around the country that we've relied heavily on these folks, and I just want to acknowledge them. Buddy is available to go any, over any functional aspects or a, a sectional, and um, any technical questions would either go to him or the ones I mentioned online. Thank, Thank you very you. much, uh, Senator Hughes. Before we go to questions, I, I just do want to um, recognize the folks that you had mentioned and, and where they're at here in terms of uh, they're also being available for questions. We have Courtney Moran, who's the attorney at law with Hemp Law LLC. Uh, Robert Carter is the chief agronomist uh, for the Division of Agriculture. Joan Wilson, assistant attorney general with the Department of Law. And Arthur Keyes, director of the Division of Agriculture. Uh, so with that, uh, do we have any questions of the committee? Uh, Representative Guerra? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm pretty sure everything is fine, and I, and I support the bill, and, and I don't know if it's open to cross-sponsorship, but I would cross-sponsor if it is. Um, uh, I know there's been a change in federal policy with the new president on marijuana prosecutions, but since there's a statute that says this is allowed, my my understanding is that even though they've shifted policy on marijuana prosecutions they can't shift policy on hemp prosecutions is that am i accurate on that um through the chair representative Guerra, i believe that is true and and courtney maybe can speak to that but i will say that it emphasizes the need for for passage of this so we can just separate hemp from marijuana i think it, it just draws the need to do that sooner rather than later but as far as um i don't believe it's in violation of federal statute, it's in compliance. And that's why the bill got a little bit longer than when we originally, uh, Senator Johnny Ellis's original f uh, bill because of the federal law in 2014. Mr. Chair, I think that's good enough for me. If you find out otherwise, just let us know. But I think that's probably right. Thank you. Do we have any further questions of the committee? Seeing none, uh, is there anything further from either of the sponsors? Seeing none, let's go ahead and move to public testimony. And um, so I will open up public testimony for SB6. And um, looks like we have nine people so far on the line. So I would ask if we could try to keep it to about two minutes. And um, I will first go to the Kenai LIO. Uh, Mr. Bob Har in Kenai, if you're there, if you could please state your name and your affiliation and proceed with your testimony. My name is Robert Har. I'm in uh, Kenai. I'm from Kasilof, Alaska. Uh, we actually have a ranch in southeast Colorado as well. We have 4,700 acres down there. Uh, many of you know me. Um, I'm a, a, a patent developer, innovator, and uh, where I did the economic cost of drainage failure study for Ashto for the entire nation, I became aware about our degrading uh, uh, infrastructure. So. What I'd like to do is involve my public testimony matter record, of course, and importance in passing this bill. I developed a lot of provisional patents and patent applications around uh, coming up with lining materials for uh, our degrading infrastructure. And uh, we, last year for six months, we, I was involved with uh, Colorado um, University along with Pure Hemp Technologies and Canopy. Uh, who develops a lot of the hemp products. We, we uh, farmed over 900,000 acres of hemp last year. We're finding a lot of um, unique applications for hemp over and above what a lot of people uh, are, realize. And I am very available for technical questions. I'm not gonna go into it very long because I'm, I'm limited on time. But uh, on the paper I submitted, 
there you'll see a pipe relining guide and that gives facts about what we need not only here in the united states but nationwide and my patents use hemp fiber and bass fiber composites for fibrous materials adding strength to products and um, i have ndas and alliance members who want to use hemp worldwide it's a trillion dollar industry it will help bring over a billion dollars in taxable revenue i'm sure to this state if we can get this done and get some farmers interested in doing it and uh it's an extremely good product uh we a lot of you may or may not know about the the other um chemical aspects of it but i'm going to keep my my uh, technical presentation short but um uh, some of the qualities we need in our infrastructure because it's degraded so bad is that there was Orangeburg and cement as asbestos pipe and other materials used for our sewer water lines like in, like you may have heard about in um, uh, Flint, Michigan, for instance. Last year alone, we, we cured and lined over 150,000 miles of water resources. A lot of the materials are NSF approved. so. We're a long ways into this already, and I would like to see Alaska become more involved and uh, on the agriculture aspect and actually marketing to add additional revenue to our deficiency here in Alaska. We're not a um, – this is more sustainable, actually, than gas and oil because it's not stock market driven. So Mr. these Sorry. are some of the things that I'd like to say in short real quickly. I didn't go by my uh, – my, by my writing here, but it, it's all within the writing of this. One really important thing that we and discovered Mr. last Hall, year I'm sorry, if you could testing, please wrap up. Was the herd part of the plant has a serum in it, which has been developed for remediation properties, and we have tested this at the Suncor Energy Refinery in Wyoming, and it reacts real. It, it reacts and neutralizing heavy metals, benzenes, PCBs, and things like that. So there's other uses for this other than medication and other, other solutions. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Har. Um, and uh, just so folks know, if they would like, they can also submit their testimony or anybody who's not testifying but also wants to submit testimony. Uh, they can do so by submitting uh, that in writing to, I believe that's House Finance at aKLEG.gov. Does that sound right? So House Finance at aKLEG.gov. Just wanted to make sure I've got the right one. Um, so with that, thank you, Mr. Har. Are there any questions of the committee uh, for Mr. Har? Seeing none, um, Ms. Amy uh, Seitz in Soldatna, um, if you're there, if you could also. Um, State your name and your affiliation and proceed with your two-minute testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the House Finance Committee. For the record, my name is Amy Seitz, Executive Director for the Alaska Farm Bureau, and I am here to speak in support of Senate Bill 6. Um, agriculture production is on a rise in Alaska. We're seeing more farms popping up, more varieties of agricultural products, and an increase in demand for local products. And we should all be looking for ways to assist in expanding the agriculture industry. This would benefit the economy and sustainability of the state. Senate Bill 6 is one way that we can help expand the agriculture industry. It's setting up a pilot program uh, to study the growth, cultivation, and marketing of industrial hemp. And I'm, I'm sure you've all read some facts about hemp, but it was uh, – a staple crop for a long time in the U.S. Um, until it was reclassified as a controlled substance, and I believe that happened in the 70s. Uh, it's one of the most versatile natural fibers being used uh, with over 25,000 different uses from food and fiber to construction and cosmetics. Uh, and I know there have been some question on whether or not industrial hemp would be a viable crop in Alaska, but without the passage of Senate Bill 6, we're not going to be able to find out. Uh, right now, the number I've heard is that the retail value in the U.S. is over $600 million and that the raw material of industrial hemp we are currently having to import since we can't grow it. Um, right now, some states are allowing it. 
and even if we can't do everything with hemp, it's, it's a good source of animal feed. Uh, it's a good source of bedding. Uh, our farmers can use it as a rotation crop and, and use it as a soil supplement. It's also a very prolific pollinator, which can help our, our honeybee industry and other pollinators in the state. So even if it takes us a little while to get infrastructure built, there's a lot of uses for the raw material that we can uh, benefit from up here. And just uh, as I stated above, we should all be looking for ways to expand our agriculture industry in Alaska, and I hope that you would support Senate Bill 6. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Seitz, for your testimony. Uh, does the Finance Committee have any questions? Uh, seeing no questions, we will move over to Fairbanks and the Offnets and then up to Homer. So uh, let's see here. The next person in Fairbanks, uh, John Brading, if you're there, if you could state your name and your affiliation and proceed with your two minute testimony. Yeah, uh, John Brading here, and uh, I live at 2204 Steese Highway, Fairbanks, Alaska. And I'm uh, representing myself. I want to uh, thank Shelley Hughes for bringing forth this SB6 Alaska Grown Industrial Hemp Act. My biggest concern about the SB6 uh, Act is to amend it to include small plot gardeners for growing industrial hemp for personal use on their own property. And uh, my next uh, thing I'd like to say is that uh, what is biodiesel? Well, you can convert hemp oil into biodiesel. It's a cleaner burning diesel fuel made from vegetable oil, oil or industrial hemp oil. Simply stated, biodiesel is a vegetable oil molecule with the glycerol compound removed. Glycerol is a compound commonly used in, to make soap. Like uh, petroleum diesel, wild diesel contains hydrogen and carbon molecules. It also contains oxygen molecules, which create a cleaner, more complete burn of the fuel. That's the key, more oxygen, cleaner burn. <clears throat> Any diesel equipment can use biodiesel, cars, trucks, boats, tractors, generators, and heating oil, which we desperately need to do to clean up the air, especially in Fairbanks and in the valley. They're having huge problems there too. And uh, if you compare biodiesel with petroleum diesel, biodiesel reduces CO2 carbon dioxide approximately 78%, reduces CO carbon monoxide approximately 50%, reduces hydrocarbons by uh, around 70% and reduces particulate matters by 50% and reduces SO2 sulfur dioxide by 100%, which is still exists in regular diesel. And that's one of the major causes of PM 2.5. <clears throat> so, Fossil fuels contain complex toxic compounds, but pure biodiesel from hemp oil derived from the plant material contains only simple organic compounds that are non-toxic and biodegradable. We desperately need, we need to, to add this to regular diesel in order to reduce the PM 2.5 problem. I'm sorry, Mr. Brading, if you could is, please wrap up. Is in its pure form in a Combination with the petrol diesel decreases tailpipe emissions, carbon dioxide and uh, sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, hydrocarbons and other air toxins. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brading. I, I realize you may have more there. And um, again, folks, if they would like to uh, submit their uh, testimony in writing, you can do so by uh, emailing uh, that to housefinance at AK leg.gov. Um, with that, does the Finance Committee have any questions for Mr. Brading? Seeing no questions, uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, let's move over to the offnets. Um, Gershon Cohen from Haynes, if you're there, if you could state your name and your affiliation and proceed with your two-minute testimony. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair Foster and Co-Chair Seaton. My name is Gershon Cohen. I'm calling from Haynes. 
and I, I really appreciate this opportunity to speak on behalf of SB6 today, and I want to especially thank uh, Senator Hughes for sponsoring this legislation. I, I'd actually like to speak to one aspect of this legislation that directly affects my family that hasn't been mentioned yet. Um, my granddaughter will be three years old in May, and when she was three months old, she was diagnosed with a very rare form of epilepsy known as Acardi syndrome. It's uh, similar to Dravet's and Lennox Gastel and West syndrome, a number of uh, childhood epilepsies uh, that, that unfortunately um, are very uh, harmful to many kids in Alaska and in our country. The long-term prognosis for Acardi kids is dire, uh, to say the least. They, most of them will never gain any motor skills and spend their lives in a wheelchair. On the advice of her neurologists, we started her on a series of anti-seizure medications, which are very, very powerful and have very serious side effects. They damage the liver and the kidneys and other internal organs. The goal is to try to stop seizures from starting in the children. I did a lot of research on this. I have a background in biochemistry and molecular biology, and I did a lot of research on CBD, uh, cannabidiol, which is a derivative in industrial hemp, because I'd heard that it was as good or better than any of the prescribed pharmaceuticals at reducing and, in many cases, eliminating seizure activity in epileptics. And it does not have the side effects that are seen with conventional therapies. So when she was six months old, we started giving her CBD every day, in addition at that time to the drugs prescribed by her doctors. But at 16 months, uh, my granddaughter was still unable to lift herself to a sitting position. And we as a family, my daughter, son-in-law, my, my wife and I, we made a very, very difficult decision. We decided to wean her off of the drugs that we knew were inhibiting motor development, but kept her on CBD for seizure control. About a month later, which is just about what we figured it would take for the prescription drugs to be completely free out of her body, she started to change. Uh, one day she raised herself to a sitting position. A few weeks later, she started turning around on the floor. A few more weeks went by and she was scooting around the room. And within a few months, she was walking, holding on to objects, and then a, and, and about five months after the drugs were out of her system, she was walking without assistance. My granddaughter is going to be three years old in May. She now goes to play sessions at the gym here in Haynes every week, and she runs and plays and rides a tricycle with her peers. Um, and I should mention that we have not witnessed any seizures, no seizures, in 26 months of using CBD cannabidiol. During my research, I also became aware that thousands of veterans across the country are using CBD to lessen the impact of post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. Uh, it's primarily for this reason that Congressman Young became a founding co-chair of the Cannabis Caucus in the U.S. Congress about a year ago. Um, and the American Legion, the National American Legion Office, has passed two resolutions uh, in 2016 for the full legalization of CBD and medical marijuana because of so many veterans being helped by it. I'm sorry, Mr. It's Cohen, if you could please wrap up. Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis because CBD reduces tremors. People are getting help from arthritis. And in the last few years, we've seen a very rapidly growing use of CBD for treating chronic pain, and it's being used as a substitute for opioids. Uh, the fact that it, it alleviates chronic pain is great, but it also does that without being addictive, unlike the opioids. Um, all of these positive Mr. Cohen, if you could please wrap documented up. documented in clinical studies as well as anecdotal reports. Uh, but I, I'd have to say the greatest proof, I think, of CBD's ability to address these neurological disorders is the fact that the pharmaceutical industry is, at this moment, scrambling to produce and market synthetic CBD because they know where this is going. Mr. And, Cohen? And they're going to be, they've got to have a product on Mr. the market Cohen? or they're going to be losing a lot of market share. Uh, to Mr. CBD. Cohen, can you hear me? They're still trying to push pharmaceuticals that have tremendous side impacts, side effects. My granddaughter will probably be taking CBG her whole life. As she grows, as she gets bigger, she has to take more because the dosage is based on a milligram per kilogram body weight. Um, 
as we are hoping she will be able to get CBD from producers in Alaska. Uh, the more CBD Mr. Produced, Cohen, because more industrial hemp is produced, the more people will have access to it and the prices will go down. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm trying to be fair to everybody here and, and we want to give everybody the same amount of time and so I don't think it's fair if we give some folks more than others. So. Um, again, just uh, if folks would like to submit their testimony in writing to the House Finance Committee, uh, they can do so by sending that to uh, housefinance at aklg.gov. Um, Frank uh, Turney in Fairbanks, if you're there, if you could put yourself on the record and uh, put your name, your Hello? affiliation on the record and proceed with your two-minute testimony. Hello? We can hear you, Frank. Yeah, this is Frank Turney. Can you hear me? <laughs> Mr. Turney, we can hear Hello? you. if. If you could put your name and your affiliation on the record and proceed with your two-minute testimony. Yeah, Frank Turney, to you already, well, I'm just a private citizen. I just want to say hemp, hemp, hooray, and thank uh, Shelley Hughes, Senator on Senate Bill 6, passing the Senate, and uh, the uh, recent testimony on CBD and children, and also John Brady's regarding hemp for fuel. I'd just like to say, uh, since the early 1990s, I've been educating people on the industrial hemp since I met Jack Hare up here at wrote the uh, historical uh, history of the emperor wears no clothes on hemp. And I just want to acknowledge some people here in the interior, some elected officials. Uh, and Lloyd Hilling, a former city councilman, was the first resolution to his support industrial hemp as I passed in uh, Michael Dukes from the Borough Assembly, and that passed also. And then Mayor Ward uh, from Fairbanks uh, uh, North Pole passed a resolution to support for industrial hemp. Uh, all what I've heard testimony, I would just be uh, uh, singing to the hemp choir. And uh, every a lot of positive testimony here, and I hope that uh, the the, uh, the House Finance passes this, so we can give that green light to those uh, farmers out there to grow this industrial hemp. I heard somebody mention the Declaration of Independence. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If you read a little more, uh, hemp has been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, maybe 10,000 years. Anyway, uh, thank you for it. Also, I want to thank Representative Steve Thompson, I believe it's on the Finance Committee sitting there, for getting the hemp rolling at the university. And one thing that he had a problem with, and I hope we can fix that, is because of the feds, we need that hemp seed here in Alaska. And I hope you can uh, acknowledge that maybe uh, if we've made some changes in that area, Steve. And thank you for letting me have the testimony. Thank you, Mr. Turney. Uh and I saw uh, Representative Thompson uh, nodding his head in agreement. So uh, um, thank you for your testimony. Does the Finance Committee have any uh, questions or comments for Mr. Turney? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Let's move over to Joan Wilson. Oh, actually, Joan, looks like you're listed here as available for questions, Assistant Attorney General. So we will move over to Courtney Moran. Um, looks like you're also listed for public testimony if uh, you would like Please proceed. Put yourself on the record if you could. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I am Courtney Moran. I'm an industrial hemp attorney with my firm, Earth Law LLC, and also the chief legislative strategist for agricultural hemp solutions. I am testifying today in support of Senate Bill 6 and the proposed amendments, and as Representative Drummond mentioned, that Senate Bill 6 is aligned with the intent of House Bill 172. It has been my honor and pleasure to work with Senator Hughes, Buddy Witt, Representative Drummond, Patrick Fitzgerald, and the Division of Agriculture, in particular Rob Carter, in drafting and amending this legislation that does comply with the Federal Agricultural Act of 2014, and that sets up a regulatory framework that will provide for a successful industrial hemp program for farmers, manufacturers, and agribusiness, excuse me, agribusinesses throughout Alaska. I sincerely thank our bill sponsors for their work to bring industrial hemp back to Alaska. I did want to address that question in regards to the session memo. The session memo does not change state or federal law, and it only applies to the guidance given to federal prosecutors in regards to marijuana enforcement, and it does not apply to industrial hemp. The Agricultural Act of 2014, Section 7606, which is codified at 7 U.S.C. 5940, is federal statutory law, which not only defines industrial hemp to think for marijuana, but also protects industrial hemp growth, cultivation, and marketing as is authorized under both the Agricultural Act of 2014 and that state's law. 
Further, the omnibus appropriations provisions and the exemptions that are provided in the definition for marijuana under the Controlled Substances Act also provide additional federal protection and federal authority for the implementation of state industrial hemp programs. So we don't have any issues in regards to the session memo. Senate Bill 6 will establish the Industrial Hemp Agricultural Pilot Program for Alaska, establishing industrial hemp as an agricultural product subject to regulation and registration by the Department of Natural Resources Division of Agriculture. I'm very pleased with the proposed amendments, which will ensure for a sustainable program and for a successful implementation of the program in Alaska. Upon passage, Alaska will actually join 34 other states in re-legalizing industrial hemp. And in 2017, there were 19 states that actually cultivated industrial hemp, and we are very eager to have Alaska farmers join those farmers. I hope this committee provides a unanimous due pass on Senate Bill 6 and the proposed amendments. I thank you all for your support and your encouragement for agricultural industrial hemp development in Alaska. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moran. Uh, does the We have got a question from Representative Seaton. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm not okay. sure whether this is um, a, a question for Ms. Moran or for Rob Carter later, but I wanted to get it out there so we could be thinking. Uh, page three of the bill um, on line four starts with subsection D about establishing isolation distances for the pr production of industrial hemp. And uh, one of our previous meetings, uh, this was brought up and kind of flagged a little bit, but I'm trying to figure out the uh, the purpose of that and whether if somebody was growing industrial hemp uh, could they or could industrial hemp be used as a way to uh, delegitimize um, permits that we've given for cultivation of other um, uh, other for other purposes of the species of cannabis in other words the marijuana industry with a I, I'm not sure what this isolation distance would be, but all of a sudden, uh, could industrial hemp be being grown in a in a close proximity to someone that was licensed, and then that would be a conflict in the law and not allow the cannabis cultivation that was permitted because of this statutory uh, isolation distance and preventing that uh, growing of the other variety. And so, with, that's a, with, with that's a fantastic question. Thank you for asking that, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. So the the reason that we have this in here is because of the concerns for potential cross pollination between the cannabis varieties that are marijuana and that are industrial hemp. And you know, Washington has gone so far as to include in their legislation a four mile isolation distance between the two types of cultivation. In Oregon, this is something that we have dealt with for the past four years in implementing our program. And we have very much encouraged responsible, friendly farming and ensuring that if you are a, an industrial hemp farmer that is planted in a sensitive area or an area that has a lot of marijuana cannabis cultivation, that they're only planting female plants, that they do plant non-feminized seed or are not planting clones or cuttings that they do call their males, so that there is, you know, no cross pollination or a very reduced risk of cross pollination. Also, if we look to Canada, that has a certified seed program where they have certified seed, foundational seed, and registered seed. They have their uh, minimum buffer zone between those two seed growing locations for seed certification at five kilometers, which is about 3.1 miles. And they have, you know, found that to be very successful. So I'll let Rob talk about how they plan to implement this, and but that's the theory behind this. Is I mean we don't want to see cross pollination happen or you know have any negative impacts on either the industrial hemp farmers or the marijuana growers. It's really about collaboration and responsible friendly farming. Your follow up, Representative Seaton. Uh, thank you. Yes, I guess I'm curious because we do have permits for cultivation of marijuana in the state of Alaska and if we have a four mile or a three and a half mile isolation zone as you read this bill does this prevent 
industrial hemp from being grown within four miles of a of a marijuana cultivation facility, or would it prevent um, any of the permits for uh, marijuana cultivation for being within four miles of so any place where there was industrial hemp being grown? Can, can I just reiterate, is your question, is this going to be limiting the hemp growers or is it going to be limiting the marijuana growers? Is that what you're aiming at? That's correct. If there's an isolation zone uh, required, does that mean that the which one is going to be limited? In other words, is, can hemp not be grown within four miles of a permitted marijuana growing operation? Or is the idea that a marijuana cultivation permit could not be within four miles of anywhere that is um, they're growing industrial hemp. Right. Well, since the marijuana program was implemented first, I would imagine that the way that this would be implemented would be that, you know, the marijuana folks would have deference over the industrial hemp folks. However, it doesn't mean that you can't grow industrial hemp in those areas, but it means that we would have to ensure that they're growing female plants that there wouldn't be the risk of pollen fertilizing the other female plants. And so, I mean, th this clause here is more so to establish a, a distance. And I mean, I think through research, we could determine what an actual, what the actual isolation distance needs to be for that particular region or that particular area. And then I, I believe Rob and the Division of Agriculture would have the authority to establish rules around that. And I think it, it might be good to have Rob weigh in on this as well. And thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll, I'll follow up with Rob when that comes, but I think it's a question that we need to get on the record since this is going to be st statutory provision. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a question uh, from Representative Guttenberg. Um, I just wanted to point out, Mr. Chair, at the previous meeting we had a, quite a bit of conversation about this, and um, I don't think anybody that was here is um, was part of that the the scientific community or the industry, but, but it is a it is a major concern. Thank you, Representative Guttenberg. Do we have any further questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Ms. Moran, for your testimony. Uh, let's move over to Talkeetna. Ember Hain, if you're there, if you could state your name, your affiliation, and proceed with your two-minute testimony. Hi, my name is Ember Haynes, and I'm representing myself. Um, I am in support of SB6 and agricultural hemp in Alaska. My husband and I own Denali Hemp Company and Silver Bear Sundries. Um, we infuse oils with wild-crafted and homegrown plants. And we've actually been importing legal hemp seed oil to incorporate um, for about 10 years now. And our goal is to utilize Alaskan-grown and processed hemp just as we do other plants in our oils and balms. We also raise livestock on our rural acreage and hemp cultivated on our own land could be used to supplement our animals with greens and fodder and bedding. Hemp is economically sustainable and the whole plant can be utilized. Um, the quick fact is that um, one acre of hemp can produce anywhere from 600 to 1,000, perhaps even 2,000, dependent on the strain, um, pounds of seed, 50 to 100 gallons of oil, and two to five tons of fiber stock. And that would just supplement my business and my entire farm operation. And honestly, I represent Alaskans who live a self-sustaining lifestyle, um, many with similar small scale plans. We're not proclaimed ag farmers, but we are capable and would like to pay the fee and follow the guidelines and be included in the pilot program. Alaska is such a vast state with so many microclimates and potential uses of hemp that farmers and non-farmers alike with small to large acreages can all be successful and find their own little niche. I understand that there is a concern with staffing and managing too many applications 
in the program, but perhaps more fees with more applicants will allow for more staff. And I really appreciate that the Department of Ag's mission is to help Alaskans succeed. And as you've heard from all of the other testimonies today, agricultural hemp is definitely a hot market right now. And Alaskans have been successful with alternative ag on small scales, such as peonies and birch products, fisheries, crafters, among other markets. And the same could be for hemp. And I encourage the House to pass SB6 and let Alaska get a piece of that USA hemp industry. I hope that there will be a provision for Alaskans who have a plan and are willing to follow the pilot program regulations and pay fees, such as Colorado and Oregon continue to successfully do without participant limits. And of course, to keep the fees at a minimum, whatever is needed to successfully run um, a hemp industry in Alaska. And I thank all the supporters of Ag Hemp, Senators Ellis and Hughes and Arthur Keyes and Rob Carter for all of your efforts. And please pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hain. Uh, we've got a question from Representative Kawasaki. Um, thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. I just had a really quick question. I, I might have misunderstood. Do you said that? You, do you did you say that you currently produce hash oil from hemp that's imported? Um, no, not okay. not at all. We take legal hemp seed oil that doesn't have has less than a trace, if any, on THC that anyone can purchase. And we use that just as we would olive oil, um, avocado oil, et cetera, to, um, to get all the properties out of herbs such as yarrow and devil's club and such. But no hashish oil being made. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kawasaki. Do we have any further questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, thank you for your testimony, Ms. Hain. Uh, Mr. Ed Martin, if you're there from Cooper Landing, if you could state your name and your affiliation and proceed with your two-minute testimony. Thank you, Chairman Foster. Um, my name is Ed Martin. I'm from Cooper Landing, and I'm representing my family. Um, I testified last week uh, and put a little bit into that conversation with you folks about passing this bill. Um, I, I believe it's long overdue. I believe that the benefits of industrial hemp uh, will benefit the state of Alaska. It'll create jobs uh, all during the time in which we need to create revenue and new wealth. So, you know, uh, there's been lots of testimony here. I am supportive of all that testimony, and I would encourage you folks to pass us out of committee today, and let's get it moving along so we can have new crops this summer. We, I appreciate the testimony, and thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, does the Finance Committee have any questions for Mr. Martin? Seeing none, uh, we appreciate your testimony. Thank you. And the last person that I have on my list here is Dennis Wade from Homer. If you're there, if you could also state your name, your affiliation, and proceed. Hello, this is Dennis Wade. I live east of Homer. I've been following the hemp bills uh, for years now. Um, I agree with all of the testimony that I've heard today. Um, we need to pass this hemp bill so Alaskan farmers and, and small farmers can start turning this into a profit. It's going to take a few years to get it up and rolling for um, paper products and things like that and, and woven garments, so we need to get going. Also, the, the, the uh, hemp oil for health uses, the, you know, it's just such a wonderful product. It's raised on a latitude above uh, Nome in Europe. Um, so basically, you can grow it virtually anywhere in the state. Uh, it could be useful for, for rural communities off the grid to be able to use it for diesel fuel, but also to make hempcrete to build structures. Uh, it's wonderful insulation. This is a product that we need to get moving. And uh, I just thank the committee for, for looking into this and the sponsors of the bill. Um, I thank a great deal. But we do need to get this moving. Uh, I heard testimony last year uh, talking about, you know, how if, if you could get high by cooking this stuff down, 
And, um, you know, that was a ridiculous conversation because you could ha take your hemp oil, put it in your truck, drive to Kenai and, or Saldana, and buy hemp products that would equivalent beer all the way to 151 in many different flavors. And, you know, it, it would cost you a lot less to do that than turn it into uh, something you could get high off of. So just um, I ask you, please, to pass this bill, and I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Wade. Um, does the Finance Committee have any questions or comments for Mr. Wade? Seeing none, uh, thank you for your testimony today. Is there anybody else in the room who would like to testify? Seeing none, uh, anybody else online who I might be missing who would like to testify? I don't see any. So with that, we will close public testimony for SB6. And uh, thank you to everybody who testified today. Again, um, for those who are watching on TV, if they'd like to testify or send in testimony, they can email us at housefinance at akleg.gov. And um, so we'll, we're going to go to the amendment process. Uh, Representative Seaton, did you have a question? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I had asked um, for a question from Rob Carter, who's available from the Division of Agriculture on the question that I had posed during public testimony. Sure, can we, we can go back. He's, since he's online, let's go ahead and do that. Um, Mr. Carter, if you're there, if you could also state your name and your affiliation and, uh, and we can have Representative Seaton restate the question. Maybe if you want to do that. For, well, first of all, are you there, Mr. Carter? Uh, Co-Chair Foster, I am here. Okay, thank you. If um, Representative Seaton, you could restate your question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I was uh, interested in the bill on page three, uh, starting on line uh, four, that subsection D about an isolation distance between um, two varieties of the product. And I'm unsure, you know, we've been talking three and a half, four miles or something for uh, pollinization, and I'm uh, a little concerned. I want to find out whether the isolation distance between here and a licensed marijuana uh, growing facility uh, would impact the area where the industrial hemp would be grown, or would it be an area restriction that would uh, cover the marijuana cultivation? Um, it doesn't seem to say in here, and I want to find out uh, what that you know, what that interaction is. Could, the, okay. Yeah, could one of these uses uh, impact the other uh, use that would be either registered or permitted? And Mr. Carter, if you could just put yourself on the record. Uh, for the record, this is Rob Carter, uh, the Division of Ag uh, in Palmer. Um, Co-Chair Seaton, your, your question is a great question. Um, I think that there's some general agronomic practices that are uh, sometimes lost in translation when it comes to when it comes to statute. Um, I think the first thing to clarify for for everyone on, on the committee and the folks listening in, isolation distances are set for for hundreds of agricultural crops uh, around the world, and those isolation distances are set in in Canada, in Oregon, and Washington, and, and they're set for the seed industry. Um, for folks that are growing industrial hemp. Uh, for the product itself will not be affected by isolation distances. There are some, some good farming practices out there um, so that one industry does not disturb another. Um, to answer your question on which industry would be impacted by the potential of cross-pollination, it, it would only be in most cases that the industrial hemp pollen, if transferred uh, and pollination occurred, uh, within the recreational cannabis or marijuana, that's where the impact would be. But again, isolation distances are set for the seed industry. If you're growing um, seed classes such as breeder or foundation or registered or seed, because that cross-pollination of one plant to the other really doesn't affect either crop until it's the prodigy of that. Um, so if you were concerned that uh, hemp would cross-pollinate with recreational marijuana or vice versa, you wouldn't see the genetic degradation of either crop until that next year from that seed crop harvested, planted, and then grown. 
Um, so really the isolation distances within the pilot program are going to be set for the seed producers and then some good agricultural practices are going to be recommended and suggested to all participants of that program um, to, to grow only female uh, um, crops that if you are within a selected area that there could be or is registered recreational uh, marijuana growers. Follow up, follow up from Representative Seaton. Thank you. And so I, I'm just trying to make sure that we have a well-established legislative record that this provision in here could not be used by someone growing uh, industrial hemp to impact the permit uh, of a marijuana cultivation activity that's permitted within the state. That I'm just... Uh, I'm in full support of industrial hemp, but I don't want to see something because this was a vote of the people and there's some people that are a a absolutely opposed to the cultivation of uh, marijuana. And I want to make sure that it's clearly on the record that uh, growing, if somebody wanted to grow industrial hemp, they couldn't then come to court and say this isolation dis distance now precludes the operation of the cultivation facility because it's of the same uh, variety or same species of the product. And, and that's all I'm doing here. I'm not trying to uh, uh, do anything else, but I want it clearly on the record that that's both the sponsor's intent and the agricultural department's intent that uh, that would not happen that way. So can I get a clarification from you, uh, just really clear that the industrial hemp would not impact the cultivation approval license of for marijuana? Uh, for the record, this is Rob Carter. Um, Co-Chair Seaton, I don't see uh, how it would be physically possible or physiologically possible uh, in the plant world on, on how... Uh, the transmittal of pollen from industrial hemp would null and void any of the current or future registrants of the uh, recreational cannabis or, or marijuana side. I, I don't see how it's, how it's physically possible. I think that the pollen transfer could uh, degradate, uh, I guess, degradate the, the, the future prodigy of recreational, and I think that's why this, this uh, line four, section D, subsection D is in there, is that when the pilot program is defined working with the Marijuana Control Board and their, res um, and their registrants of their program, we can identify the agricultural producers interested in industrial hemp seed production and make sure that we've provided good agronomic practices to those individuals to make sure they meet whatever isolation distance we need here in Alaska by region because uh, there are a lot of environmental factors that uh, can increase or decrease the, the opportunity for, for cross-pollination between similar species. So I, I do believe that it's highly unlikely that, that anyone with intent or not intent uh, could affect either of anyone producing either cannabis species. One more follow-up. Follow? I'm just, I'm not talking about the, the physiological interaction between the, uh, the pollen or the plants. I'm talking about a regulatory action where a isolation distance could be imposed that would then have a regulatory restriction on a marijuana cultivation permit. That's that's just what I want to make sure that we're all understanding that the isolation distance does not regulatorily uh, restrict a cultivation permit. For the record, this is Robert Carter. Um, Co-Chair Seaton, there is no way that uh, from a pilot program and for seed production that um, the way that I interpret this statute, and of course I, I would need assistance from the, from the Department of Law folks, that this could um, regulatorily impede anyone for applying for either pilot program or permit through the recreational side. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's, that's what I wanted to get on the record.
Thank you, Representative Seaton. Uh, we've got a question from Representative Guttenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Carter, uh, from what I remember hearing, that the marijuana cultivators were concerned about not seed production, but if there was a hemp facility within a, a distance of, of the marijuana outside production, that it was the pollen that would destroy that year's crop. That was my understanding. That was a big part of the concern from the industry. Does the, those protections in here, and is that a concern, that is legitimate concern? Because that's what I think part of the, the isolation distances in Colorado and Canada, Alberta, and the places that we heard. Uh, through the chair, Representative Guttenberg, this is Rob Carter for the record. Um, I do believe I remember that uh, correctly as you do. Um, yes, there, there are concerns from recreational growers that that, that cross-pollination from industrial hemp could degrade um, the recreational products being grown by current registrants with under that program. And I do believe that during the rules and regulations um, that will be outlined from this law, um, those will all be addressed and taken into concern to make sure that what one producer is doing within the state isn't impacting a producer in another program that's regulated by, by other folks here in the, in the state system. Um, and yes, th there are some isolation distance set and, and brought into attention in Colorado where they do have a large recreational uh, industry for, uh, for other types of cannabis. Um, and those things will have to be taken into consideration. And I think what, what really is the foundation of this, of this bill is that this is the, the generation of a pilot program so that we can have applicants that, that are selected based on their region, based on their size, and, and what their, the end point of the products they're growing are going to be. Also, so we as a state and, and as we as producers um, can understand what these impacts could be on other, other lines of business within the state. Um, and and that, that is what's so, so good about this pilot program is it will allow us to gain the data that we need to make sure um, that we have a successful industry on both sides. Thank you, Mr. Chair. He answered my question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Representative. We've got a question from Representative Kawasaki. Thank you. Um, just to just to dovetail into that into the comment, I think it, it did come up during a hearing last summer, um, and and I think we have some some uh, materials that were provided to us that say that marijuana from pollen or pollen from marijuana and hemp's been known to travel more than seven miles. Um, there's only one outdoor um, cultivation facility, and that's the one that's in Fairbanks, and so. For the Fairbanks delegation, I know that we've all been contacted individually, and it is a concern um, to hear that it could potentially damage crops um, as far as seven miles away from um, adjacent uh, plots. My question, though, had to do more with, uh, if you can answer this, I think you might be able to answer this on behalf of the department, is that the establishment of fees for the applications and registrations, um, we've had hearings over the last couple of days dealing with the fees for the marijuana licensure, that the fees are to be recouped from the folks who are part of the program. And I and I see the fiscal note, um, and it has, a lot, it's a zero fiscal note commencing in 2019 from the department. And I'm just wondering um, what kind of a fee schedule we can anticipate. And of those 25 that are mentioned in the fiscal note, whether, uh, um, it's because it sounds like to stand up the program will cost some money and then after you figure out how much it costs to regulate it may cost additional money but probably will start to lower uh, in future years and so mine has more to deal with what is the going to be the cost to the consumer who wants to buy a permit for the record this is rob carter uh through the chair representative kawasaki there are a lot of unknowns in that question, and I think that we can look nationally uh, and, and see a very diverse range of fees set per program. Um, the way the current fiscal notes ro roll out um, are, are really set to, to build that regulation, to build those rules out of in, in interpretation of, of SB6 if it moves forward and, and gets passed. Um, we would like, you know, the Division of Ag's role is to support and promote you know, agricultural production, all types of agricultural production in Alaska. And, you know, I really at this point can't tell you what the cost will be, um, but 
but the point of this legislation and, and the point of, and I, and I guess the mission of the Division of Agriculture is to help grow an industry. Um, and by doing that, we will, we will make sure through that regulatory process uh, that those fees are covered as well as then start to define how many participants we have. Of course, the greater the amount of participants, the lower the cost over time. Um, but at this point, I, I don't think I can put a number on it. Um, but it is the objective of, of the Division of Agriculture Department of Natural Resources to make this as, as affordable as possible um, because it is such a good opportunity to increase agricultural production in the state. And then just a follow up. Follow up? And, and does, um, do you, I guess the agency, feel that you have enough technical support in order to? Um, uh, we've already heard from a handful of folks that definitely want to jump on this, that, that there's enough technical support within the agency in the division to be able to handle uh, requests. Uh, through the chair, Representative Kawasaki, I do believe that. I do believe that, um, that yes, this is a crop that is that it hasn't been grown uh, in Alaska in a long time or nationally long time. Um, I do believe that the division has the has uh, both the, the professional and the academic um, background uh, to to implement the, the pilot program as well as to make it successful for all the participants involved in the future growth of this industry. Um, but second to that, um, you know, currently I, I personally sit on a natural industrial hemp regulatory kind of committee um, where all states are involved. We have we have uh, quarterly meetings, um, if not even sometimes more often to that. And majority of the states out there that have, uh, that are the, of, the, of the states that actually are currently producing industrial hemp and the 34 other that are in the process of, of getting legislation passed so it is legal within their state um, are, are very willing to help um, with the, the scientific process to make sure that we're protecting agricultural producers, growing good quality products, uh, and, and making sure that this industry moves forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Representative Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, just a little bit of a clarification. Uh, just before we get to the fiscal notes, uh, I noticed that OMB Component 2204 has $10,000 to write regulations. If you look on page two, I think that we got a typo, I believe, uh, on that first sentence. Uh, it will conduct oversight of industrial help in Alaska. I think that's supposed to be industrial hemp. It's just a, a typo. To, I'd like to see it straightened out so that we don't have it go into regulations. That we're, <laughs> we're, we're, so that was um, OMB component 2202. 2204. And, oh, 2204. And that was on the second page? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe when we get to that... Um, we need an amendment for that, or is that I just a concession? So. I just wanted to point that out, though, when, uh, when we get to the fiscal notes, that we ought to clarify that maybe. Maybe just make a note of that when you read it into the record yeah. and that correction can be made. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Representative Thompson. Do we have any further questions? Representative Wilson? Just, and we could do it on that, but I guess I'm just curious since you brought up this fiscal note. Is there a reason why this didn't come from the department and it came from the co chairs? Especially since it's talking about um, the regulations will be drafted and, and the fees will be. Um, put on those farmers who decide to get a permit? Because normally it comes from the department. So I'm just, I just want to make sure the department realizes they'll be the ones collecting the fees and, and recouping this $10,000. Um, I'm looking at, well, oh, good, okay. I was going to say, uh, Mr. Painter, if you could come up from Ledge Finance and uh, look like I was asked. Uh, yeah, go ahead and put yourself on the record. And the requester is always House Finance. No. no. For the record, Alexi Painter, Legislative Finance Division. Uh, through the chair, Representative Wilson, the, the department prepared a fiscal note that um, requested $25,000 of unrestricted general fund. The Senate Finance Committee reduced that amount to 10000 and wrote a Senate Finance Committee note of, of that. The Senate Finance Committee note also changed the fund source to GF program receipts and um, to fund that with fees. However, the fees would not come in until after the regulations are written. So the House Finance Committee note changes that back to UGF, but keeps the Senate's amount of 10,000, um, which is again, a reduction from the department's request of 25,000. Can I follow up? Follow up. So is there a way that we can do basically what happened with the marijuana to where this $10,000 gets paid back to UGF as the registration fees come in? 
or is that just automatic as they put it in? Because I mean, we expected the marijuana group to do theirs. I think it's only fair to make sure that this also um, turns into DGF as is explained on the second page. Mr. Painter. Representative Wilson, through the chair, I think in the future that would be possible, but for the startup cost of writing the regulations, there would need to be some initial cost paid for with general funds because the fee schedule will not yet be in place and they won't be able to collect those fees at that point. But in the future, I believe the intent is that the cost would be paid for with program receipts. Follow up, Representative Wilson. Well, I just want to make sure on the fiscal note it says it will be recovered. So. Just like we brought it up before, I'm sure we'll bring it up again. But thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Representative uh, Guerra. Thank you, Mr. Uh, so, uh, well, we're talking about small amounts of money, but we should that, that the fees will come in later on. They're designated, but they're not really designated. They go into the general fund, correct? Through the chair, Representative Guerra, yes, they're, as any general fund program receipts, they could be appropriate for any purpose. Thank you. Do we have any further questions? Seeing none, uh, let's jump into the amendments here. And I will move amendment number two, that is 30-LS0173 backslash E for echo.4. And is there an objection? Okay, seeing no objection. Uh, amendment number two uh, has been adopted. We'll move over to amendment number three. Now we'll move amendment number three, which is 30-LS0173 uh, backslash E.3. Uh, is there any objection? Seeing no objection, uh, amendment number three is adopted. And it looks like that is all the amendments that we have. So let's go ahead and read the fiscal notes into the record. Uh, Representative Guerra. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Assuming the addition of the comma does not change the fiscal notes. Um, uh, Senate Bill 6, version E, has five fiscal notes. Um, the first is a zero fiscal note from the Department of Commerce, Community and Economic Development, Appropriation, Alcohol and Marijuana Control Office, Allocation, Alcohol and Marijuana Control Office, OMB Component 3119. Um, second zero fiscal note is from the Department of Law, Criminal Division, Criminal Justice Litigation is the allocation, uh, OMB component number 2202. The next is a zero fiscal note from the Department of Public Safety, Appropriation State Troopers, Allocation Statewide Drug and Alcohol Enforcement Unit, OMB component 3052. The next is a zero fiscal note from the Department of Public Safety for Laboratory Services, also a zero fiscal note, um, OMB component. 527. Uh, the last one is the $10,000 fiscal note from the Department of Natural Resources for uh, the drafting and publication of rec uh, regulations. Um, appropriation Agriculture Allocation North Latitude Plant Material Center, OMB Component 2204, to make it clear that all references in these fiscal notes to industrial help, while we support industrial <laughs> help, are really to industrial hemp. Um, and um, with that, Mr. Chair, I think that's all the fiscal notes. And we've got a question from Representative Wilson. Right, so component 2204 with the North Latitude Plant Material Center, they're not writing the regulations. That's in another um, one of the fiscal notes. In fact, it's in a fiscal note that they say that they're going to just absorb the cost. This is just determined after regulations are drafted to administer the program. So do we have this $10,000 on the right fiscal note? Because Chair, once I think, uh, Representative Gere. Chair, um, I think uh, Representative Wilson is correct. Um, uh, they'll enter into an RSA with the Department of Law to assist in the drafting of the regulations. Um, um, and, uh, but it's the usual $10,000. Representative Wilson. And I just want to also put on the record that there's a cost in, the, in these other departments, but they said that they're going to absorb it. So just so people realize that it's not free, but they're going to take on with it. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any further questions or comments on the fiscal notes? Seeing none, um, Co Chair Seaton, if I could have a motion. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I move H, uh, SB6 version 30 LS 01. 
73 backslash E from House Finance Committee as amended with individual recommendation and the attached fiscal notes. Are there any objections? Seeing no objections, uh, SB 6 version 30-LS0173 backslash E for echo as amended with individual recommendations in the attached fiscal notes is reported out from House Finance Committee. And uh, so with that, uh, folks could just remember to please, please stay to sign the report. And our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, February 12th at 1.30 p.m. So that is after the weekend. And at this meeting, we will hear three extension bills. HB 302, which is to extend the Board of Professional Counselors, HB 318, which is to extend the Board of Social Work Examiners, and HB 323, to extend the Board of Pharmacy, and uh, HB 299 has been removed from Monday's schedule, and that was the Alcoholic Beverage Control Board. Um, so with that, if there is nothing else to come for the committee, we, uh, Representative Grin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. I just wanted to applaud uh Senator Hughes and, and Representative Dremen on this bill. I think it's a, it's an exciting movement for the state of Alaska. And uh, I know in, in my constituency and throughout the state, um, I think uh, this is the sort of uh, innovative thinking we need. And it's very exciting for entrepreneurial people and uh, for our state. So just wanted to applaud them for their efforts and, and great job. Thank you, Representative Grin. And with that, we will be adjourned at 2.44 p.m. Thank you.